Hello there. Welcome to October's edition of Let's Talk Astronomy. In the program today, we're going to look at two showpiece objects in the night sky. You might want to image them, take photographs of these objects. If so, we've got just the person for you. My guest today is James McCall, and he's going to tell us how to get into astro imaging and producing some really good photographs of objects in the night sky. But we're going to begin with a couple of pieces of astronomy news. Last month, we saw a supernova, an exploding star in the sky. Unfortunately, it wasn't particularly close. It was 21 million light years away in the Pinwheel Galaxy. And here, we have a lovely photograph taken by a colleague of mine, Andy Green, and it shows that Pinwheel Galaxy, and we've marked with the two lines, the exploding star. This supernova, started off as a couple of stars. One got old and died, became a white dwarf. That white dwarf grabbed gas from its companion star. It got too big and it exploded 21 million years ago. The light from that explosion reached us just a few weeks ago. Now, if you want to find the Pinwheel Galaxy, it's fairly simple, but unfortunately, the light from the supernova will have faded away. Here we see on this image, the plough or the Big Dipper. To find the pinwheel galaxy, go to the handle of the Dipper and the end two stars, Alcade and Mizar. The pinwheel galaxy, catalogue number M101, makes a neat little triangle above those end two stars in the handle of the plough. And it's a lovely target for a small telescope. So although you won't see the supernova, you will see another star city in which that explosion occurred. We're looking north, of course, looking towards the plough, and north is the second bit of our news, because that is going to be the focus of attention on the night of October 8th. So let's take a step back and look at the plough. There's the plough, the Big Dipper. If you take the end two stars of the ploughshare, take a line upwards, you'll reach Polaris, the North Star. Not the brightest star in the sky, but it's the only one that doesn't move as the Earth turns round. Winding around between the pole star and the plough are the dim stars of Draco the Dragon. On the night of October 8th, the dragon may be breathing fire. Because on October 8th, if astronomers are right, if their predictions are correct, our Earth is going to crash into some comet dust. That comet dust is going to burn up in the atmosphere in a storm of shooting stars. And they could come in hundreds. If you look north, after sunset, between sunset and maybe 10, 11 o'clock at night, I hope you'll catch lots and lots of falling stars. One person who will be watching the sky on October the 8th is my guest tonight. That is, he will be watching the sky if he's not treading the boards in a theatre. He's an actor. He's an astronomer. It's James McCall. Welcome to Let's Talk Astronomy, James. Hi, Dennis. Now, James, you're not just an observer. You're an astro-imager. Yeah. Yeah. So, would you like to just tell us how you got into imaging in the first place? Um, yeah, my, my brother had a, a Tasco telescope um, growing up and I never really uh, bothered to look through it. Uh, it was only after I left home, strangely, uh, that I decided I wanted to see what the moon looked like, um, planets, these kind of things. Yeah. Um, I actually thought that they, they would look like I'd seen them in the magazines and the <laughs> bubble and, and the rest. Huge images. Yeah, um, <clears throat> so it was quite a learning curve. Um, yeah. But I'll never forget the first scope I got. Um, I went on to buy my own. Um, yeah. uh, Jupiter was the first thing I saw. Uh, th I actually saw the three moons and thought that there was a mistake. I thought they were a reflection. <laughs> and only, only afterwards did I realise I, I had seen the moons and it, I couldn't believe it. it was, uh, this is a great discovery, isn't it? I, I couldn't, yeah, yeah the, the sky forms half of your landscape and yet I'd yes. never actually looked at it. I, I yes. couldn't believe it. You know? yeah. um, and but that went on to imaging. Yeah, um, I wanted a picture to show people. Uh, I've right. seen Jupiter. Have you? Or have you got a picture? Yeah. Um, no, but I have seen it. Um, so um, I came to uh, Rother, Rother Valley um, and uh, was advised that I can connect my camera to the telescope to take these pictures. Yeah. Um, so I duly did that. Um, started with the moon. Um, so you, you've got a couple of cameras here. Uh, could you show us which, which one did you take this picture of the moon with? Uh, well, the moon was actually the very first shot that I took. Mm. Um, this is a mosaic of uh, 
nine images, you can probably just see the little lines there where I stitched them together. So why do you do a mosaic instead of just taking the whole moon? Um, because the image that I got was too small to take it in one shot. Right. Um, yeah. I'd connected the camera up to the scope and found that the field of view um, was, was quite narrow uh, yeah. for that target. So you only seen a, a piece of the moon? Yeah, um, so I decided, okay, I went on the, the forums and discussed yeah. it with people. Yeah. Um, uh, Astronomy is a great way of uh, meeting people. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and found that by making a mosaic, I could get the target I want. And, and actually, because it was a smaller field of view, um, as you can see, the, the, the detail, uh, although not the best image, obviously, that I would produce, the detail is still there very easily. Uh, so it's a very accessible way of, of, of getting into imaging. That just looks to me a superb image, if that's a starting image. I was very pleased. <laughs> 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 particularly, particularly stitching it together uh, as a mosaic. I think, that, I think that's terrific. Yeah, and it, it was just a normal, I'd say normal, it was an SLR camera. Yeah. Um, so it was a, a, an everyday camera. Yeah. Um, with a, a, a very inexpensive, uh, what's called a T-ring, uh, which is basically just a small metal ring. Yeah. Um, to so connect, that fits to the telescope? Yeah, it just allows the camera to connect firmly to the telescope uh, yeah. so that you can then start to take these shots. Yeah. So that's your first image. Where did you go from there? Um, well, uh, I moved on to the planets from there. Um, there's another shot of the moon. I got a little bit more uh, creative with that one. That's lovely and crisp, <laughs> isn't it? Yeah, um, again, going on the forums, uh, going online, speaking to people um, and just talking about what you can do to improve the images. Yeah. Uh, I think you find once, you, once you're starting imaging, it's very easy to get into. Yeah. Uh, but then the, the, the learning curve gets steeper and steeper. Uh, the expense gets more and more and then you get hooked. And before <laughs> you know it, there's, uh, you're spending a lot of money. But it, it, um, certainly um, when you're starting out, it's a very inexpensive uh, hobby to get into. Um, there's a lot of targets that are very cheaply. Accessible. And would you advise people who are getting started to maybe start on the moon? Is it a good start? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. 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 I mean, you, you don't even need a telescope. You can get a, a normal uh, handheld camera or an SLR, yeah. Yeah. pop it on a tripod uh, yeah. or, or hold it very still. Yeah. Um, and, um, and yeah, absolutely start with the moon. Uh, yeah. Move on to planets. Um, and obviously, if you're really interested, then deep sky objects, yeah. these kind of things. Yeah. Um, from the, from the moon. <laughs> <laughs> that's like one of mine. <laughs> yeah, that's, um, that's not my fault. That is a proper image, I do promise you. Um, that was, that's Mars, um, believe it or not. Um, and this was actually my first webcam image. Um, I was advised that, that planets, it was better to take shots of planets with a webcam yeah. um, for, for various reasons. Um, so I then obviously bought a webcam. Yeah. You can't just use any webcam, it has to be a, a, a particular types. Um, I, I used the Celestron Next image, which, uh, which was uh, specifically designed to do so that. So that just slots into the telescope like an eyepiece would? Absolutely, and then you connect it to a PC or a laptop and uh, use the supply software from there. Um, yeah. I wasn't very good in the beginning. It was a, a difficult target. Um, I was then advised to move on to Jupiter. Ah, yeah. um, again, you know, the, there are mistakes there, but as, as a beginner, um, it was wonderful to, to not yeah. only see these targets, but get access to them and, and, and you know. So you can now go to say, there's my picture of Jupiter. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and you, you've had the pleasure of seeing it live and, and knowing, not, not just that you you know, you're not trying to take Hubble-style uh, images. You're trying to take an image of what you really have seen. Yeah. And, and I think there's a... I and it's through your telescope, it's your image, it belongs exactly. to you. Yeah, yeah. it's, it's, it's a, a real thrill to be able to pass it on and, and say, you know, this is what I saw. Yeah. Um, so yeah. it's, yeah. yeah Terrific. Um, so this was the first scope I got. This is a, a, a Skywatcher 150PL uh, on an EQ32 mount. Yeah. There's a small motor there to keep it motor driven. Yeah. Um, you don't need that for the moon. I don't, you don't really need it for planets. Is oh, they fairly help. bright? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it does help. Um, the motor's really for, more for your deep sky objects yeah. and things like that. Yeah. With what I regard as um, the top end of beginner scopes, with a scope like that and a mount like that, there's, there's a, a vast array of targets that you can collect, up to 60 second, um, what, what are called subs, uh, 60 second shots. Yeah. Um, Oh yeah, with, with, a, with a straightforward uh, beginner to intermediate setup like that, you can yeah. access. That you, you can get into the imaging. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah very yeah. much so. Yeah. Um, so um, just a few more really, uh, these are the Pleiades. Um, so we're now into deep sky objects. Yeah, of course, um, planetary um, thought, right, let's just jump straight into DSIs, <laughs> um, as you do. Um, and that is with, I presume, your DSLR camera. Again, it was the same camera um, connected to the same scope. Right. Um, yeah. The advantage being with the smaller field of view, uh, the smaller DSOs then became available. Yeah. Um, yeah. There's uh, uh, M1, I think that's M1, isn't it? Crab Nebula? That's um, the, now, just tell me a little bit about where you, where you imaged that from. 
Are uh, you in a dark sky? No, that's actually in my back garden. That's amazing. Yeah, I live in the centre of town and there's, there's quite a lot of light pollution. Um, now, for the, for the deep sky objects, as opposed to planetary, I did have to put a, a light pollution filter yeah, on. Yeah. Um, I use the astronomic one, which is quite expensive, but you can uh, connect relatively cheap uh, light pollution filters to your camera to get basically the same shot. Yeah, I mean, that's remarkable. There we see the aftermath of a star that exploded 6,000 years ago, imaged yeah. from a backyard in Chesterfield. I mean, that is just fantastic. Yeah, it was, uh, it was quite special, actually, I, when, I, when I first saw that. Yeah. Um, and again, the horse head. Uh, yeah, same camera, same blue. scope. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, it's... Um, uh, yeah, of course, Nebula and Orion. Favourite object, beautiful photograph. Absolutely. Yeah. Great starting DSA. What, what do you call that um, away from the nebula, just to the left? You, you um, I'm dominate. not sure on the technical name, but uh, I call it the running man. The running man, that's, that's, right. that's yeah. the one I liked. Yeah, yeah, that sounds great to me. Um, uh, of course, Ring Nebula. Um, so, yeah, it, I, we, I just progressed on from there. And, of course, the images, as you can see, are just with, with more and more equipment, um, the images, um, not the greatest photo, but I moved on to uh, more expensive stands and scopes. And then you really do start to get to your, um, you, you know, your, your more famous DSOs, and, um, Andromeda, uh, Veil Nebula. Fantastic. And uh, the, the sideways North American <laughs> Nebula. So, yeah. Um, this is one of my bugbears. I've, I've very rarely seen this in my sky, but that's a beautiful image. Yeah, beautiful it's, image. Yeah, enjoy taking that one. Yeah, yeah. Mm. That's fantastic. Look, I have got a webcam at home. It's gathering dust. I'm getting it out this winter. You've inspired me. You so your starting images and how you work through. God, that's an inspiration to everybody, James. Thank you very much. Thanks ever so much. Thank you. And finally, we'll take a look at the sky in October. Now we're looking south, and here we can see the stars of autumn. And there we see the autumn square, the square of Pegasus. As usual, our pictures come from Stellarium. If we put in the lines, there we can see the square of Pegasus. To the top left is Andromeda. Count three stars from the left of the square and then three stars upwards. You see a hazy patch of light. You have found the Andromeda galaxy. That's one of the showpiece objects of the sky. You can see it with your naked eye, see it with binoculars even better in a telescope. But for the real showpiece, look left of the square, and there is the planet Jupiter, biggest planet in the solar system. With binoculars, you'll see four little stars alongside. Those are its four great moons. With a telescope, you'll see the cloud bands and zones quite clearly. And we'll finish with some of James's pictures. Here's that picture of Jupiter, that's just how it looks through a telescope. You can see the bands and zones there. You might even see the great red spot. And here, James' picture of Andromeda, that huge galaxy, two and a half million light years away. With a telescope, we'll only see the middle, the nucleus. If you could see the whole thing, it would stretch out in the sky to twice the size of the full moon. So there are gems in the sky in October. There's the Andromeda galaxy, there's Jupiter, there's the shooting stars. And of course, if you want to get in touch with us at Let's Talk Astronomy, contact details will follow at the end. Some of you have already sent your images, they're coming now in the gallery. Till next time, I wish you clear skies.